Well, hello, congregation, family and friends, and Bereans. I pray that all was well with you. Thank you for joining me for this Sunday broadcast. Well, I gave you a fair warning, didn't I? I said that this was going to be one of the most important messages that I've ever preached in my ministry. This, this, this is a message that I've been thinking about for a couple of days. It's really been laid heavy on my heart. This is a message that kept me up last night. I kept waking up over and I couldn't get comfortable. This is a message that I've been thinking about all morning long as I've been preparing for this. If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to the book of Jonah, one of the minor prophets, and turn to Jonah chapter 3. We'll be getting there presently. Jonah 3. I want to show you a specific example of what I'm talking about because it will answer the question, where are today's sackcloth and ashes? That's the question. It's an important question. You know, here we are, the first Sunday, if you're watching this live, it's the first Sunday in August of 2020. What a year it has been, right? Two major things have happened so far this year and are still happening that have unified our planet. Number one was the case of Black Lives Matter. It was the case of the killing of George Floyd and other people. It is the realization that there is true and real systemic racism put into our society specifically against people of color. Now, some people don't want to hear that. It's a raw subject with some people. They don't like hearing it. And I'm not, I don't have a platform here where I get political. But this is something, if you look around, this is something where we, as the human race, have been unified around the world. There's been countries that have marched in support of Black Lives Matter that we never thought would stand with us. We're still seeing it to this day. There are still protests going on around U.S. cities and around the world to reform and, and correct the police violence that have been happening, to, com to fix the crimes against people of color, to change the system, not just reform it, but break it down and totally rebuild it so it's fair and, and there's equity for everyone. That has unified the planet. Not everyone is on board, but I've never seen a movement that goes across the globe like that. And it's very important. And while some of us deny that it's there, and some of us deny that there isn't systemic racism, if you do the work as I've been doing and doing the research, you will find out that it is real. And it's deadly. And it's evil. And it needs to stop. The other thing that has unified us around the world, and neither one of these are positive things unless we see positive results come from that, Certainly systemic racism, there's nothing positive about it until we can dismantle it and rebuild it so it's not racist against certain people. The other thing that is uniting us is this COVID-19, this pandemic that's all around the world. Countries all around the world are losing their citizens. People, even in our home state right here in Illinois, our numbers are starting to go back up again. We're starting to get that second wave, that second surge that everybody's been talking about. Well, it's hit the Midwest here again, where our numbers right here in Chicagoland are starting to go up again. We have some of our areas right here in the state that are on the verge of taking a step back from phase four into phase three. This pandemic, because it doesn't matter if you're black, white, young, old, rich, or poor, it kills you. It kills all of us. And it doesn't matter what our color is. It doesn't matter how well off in life we are. It kills. Some people are still in denial. Some people still believe it's a hoax. Some people still believe that it's made up. Well, I happen to know people who are dead and in the ground or cremated from this very virus. So it's not a hoax. We see about celebrities every now and then you'll see a real name come up, not just a no name, which I think is just a horrible thing. Now, only the celebrities get this top billing and they die from this. There are millions of people around the world that have been sick with this. There are hundreds of thousands that we've lost of our fellow citizens. <clears throat> but you see, this has united the world because over in foreign uh, other countries across the sea in Europe and in Asia, same as the United States, we're all facing the same thing. We're all racing for a cure. We're all racing for a vaccine. And between COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter, they are two movements that are active, 
that are are paid attention to daily. They're reported on in the news, and they have united people of all nations together. You may say that's a good thing, and it is a good thing because we need to work together. We need to be unified. So what point am I trying to make, you may be wondering, before I get too fired up here? I'll tell you where we're not unified, and that is the church. The church is not unified. The church is not unified. The church is without a leader right now. When I think about going back in history, I'll just give you a few examples. When God wanted to deliver his people in the book of Exodus out of Egypt, who did he send? He sent Moses. And to back up Moses, he sent Aaron. And they went together. And Moses had a face-to-face, one-on-one with Pharaoh. How many times? At least ten times. And each time Pharaoh said no, there was another plague that came upon. Because Moses was God's man. Moses was the guy that, that God sent to talk directly to Pharaoh. Say, you are my mouthpiece. You will say what I want you to say. When, when the civil rights movement was happening in the 60s, who did God raise up? Dr. Martin Luther King. He paid for his position with his life. But he was a voice, and people were listening to him. And the church, the, the movement was getting rallied around him. Things happened. People were listening to Dr. King. God appointed Dr. King at that time to bring awareness to a situation that needed correcting. You can go through scripture again and again and see where God has selected someone. Think about the prophet Samuel. Samuel was the prophet to the nation Israel. They weren't happy with Samuel. They wanted a king. They wanted Saul. So God selected Saul and gave it to him, and Saul was a disaster. David was raised up at a specific time and led Israel and Judah. He was a man after God's own heart. And then it was passed on to Solomon. Was he God's man there? Well, Solomon fell off his throne, fell into grievous sin, and there is still a raging debate among theologians now whether Solomon was actually saved or not. But as you look through it, John the Baptist was sent at a specific time by Almighty God to bring the way and light the way and show the way that Jesus, the Lamb of God, was coming. John the Baptist had a specific role to play, and when his role was done, he was put into prison and he was eventually beheaded. Jesus was appointed at a certain time to walk this earth, to bring the gospel, to bring redemption for all those people who would believe in him. He was here at a specific time when God decreed it. Where are the leaders today? What's happening? Where are the, where are the sackcloth and ashes of today? I want to show you something here. I gave you a couple of moments to get to Jonah chapter 3. There's only 10 verses. I want to read this to you. You know the book of Jonah. I've taught on this before. And here's the situation. After Jonah tried to run from God and he was swallowed by the big fish, and in Jonah chapter 2 he repented and the the fish spit him up. Well, now God goes back to Jonah and he says, now do what I told you to do the first time. And that's where we're going to pick up the context. But I want you to see, even more important than Jonah being that voice, that was sent by God, I want you to see the people's reaction. And then I want you to compare that against what you're seeing or not seeing in the church today. Jonah 3, beginning in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So Jonah arose, he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Nineveh was an exceeding great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out. Now listen, he cried out and he said, Yet forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown. One sentence. God said, Jonah, this is where you're going. This is what you're going to say. Don't say anything else. This is all I want you to do. You go to Nineveh and you say what I tell you to say. Jonah goes into this town into Nineveh, this great city, hundreds of thousands of people, great city. And what does he do? He says one thing, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. What do you think their reaction is? Well, if you know the book of Jonah, you know exactly what their reaction is. We're going to look at that in a moment. 
But imagine, where is the voice today that says God is bringing judgment upon America, bringing judgment upon the church, bringing judgment upon this world, because we, by and large, are not listening to him. We don't care what God says. We don't want to hear what God says in his word. We're not interested. We want to do what we want to do. And God is telling us today, you got 40 days. You're going to be overthrown. And it could be. Is it possible? And I don't know if I totally believe this, but listen. Is it possible that God has allowed this COVID-19 to sweep all around the world because he's trying to get our attention? Is it possible that while this COVID-19 for a number of months now has isolated us in our homes, away from people, away from our churches, away from our jobs, all of us have had more opportunity to listen to the radio, read social media reports, turn on the television, and suddenly more and more people are aware of the Black Lives Movement and the people of color who are being murdered in the streets, and now more people are becoming awake. Is it possible that God has brought these two things together to try to get our attention? Are we the modern-day Nineveh? He's saying to us, you better pay attention or you're going to be destroyed. And this is where the church comes in and this is where the church is falling down. Watch this. Verse 5. Here's the reaction after Jonah said just one line. He said, Then the people of Nineveh believed in God and they called a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, he laid aside his robe, he covered himself with sackcloth, and he sat on the ashes. We need to talk about what is that all about. Seems like bizarre behavior, right? Where are today sackcloth now? Where is the repentance today? Where is the humility? That's what we're seeing here. The people of Nineveh, first of all, they believed in God. They believed in God. How many of us believe in God and believe what he says? And, and, and take time to read and study his word to see what God says. Not what man says. What does God say? How many of us? It says the people believed in God. They called a fast. And they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least. All of them. The king heard it. He took off his royal robe and he put on sackcloth. You know what sackcloth is? I'm going to explain it to you. It's a very, very uncomfortable fabric. It is made from the hairs of black goats. It is coarse. It is prickly. It is uncomfortable. And when you put on sackcloth, it's not something you're going to walk around comfortably in. It's not something you're going to sit comfortably in. It's irritating. It's annoying. How many of us would ever wear that voluntarily? And yet we see the king of Nineveh, the highest person in Nineveh, from the greatest down to the least, every single one of them immediately are in sackcloth. Every one of them. We're talking about the entire city in repentance, the entire city in humility, the entire city believing in God that what he said was true. You and I, we live in a world, we live in a society, we live among church people that are so arrogant that we think we can do what we want to do and there's no reprisals. We think that we can make up the rules as we go along and God, because we claim to be children of God or church people, that suddenly God is going to be pleased with us and we're immune from everything. Uh-uh. That is not the way it works. God has never done that. So now let's get back to Nineveh because the king himself did one additional thing. He not only put on sackcloth, it says here in verse 6, but he sat on ashes. What does ashes represent? Ashes, when something is burned up completely, when it's completely destroyed, what do you have left? You have ashes. Any of you who have ever lit a fire, when all the wood is gone and all that, what do you have left? You just have the ashes in the bottom. When you're burning coal or something like that, you have to bank your furnaces years ago and take out the ashes. It's what's left. And so look at the picture. You're in sackcloth and you're sitting on ashes. What are you saying? I'm in complete humility. I am in complete repentance. 
I'm begging God for forgiveness, and I'm sitting on utter ruin. Nineveh was a great city, a prosperous city. And yet, here's the king. Here's the king, the leader, showing by example what should be done. Showing by example. I'm going to sit in the ashes. Oh, but he didn't stop there, you see. Watch this in verse 7. He, this is the king of Nineveh, issued a proclamation, and it said this, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste anything. That's a fast. Do not let them eat or drink water. That is a fast. But both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. And let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Are you hearing me? Both man and beast must be covered. He, this king of Nineveh was not taking any chances. Not only was all the people in sackcloth, but even all the beasts were in sackcloth. So that God could look down upon Nineveh and not see anyone or anything that was not in total subjection and submission in humility. There was nobody there that said, I'm not wearing sackcloth. There wasn't one animal that wasn't covered. The king didn't take any chances. He wanted to make sure that if at all possible, that God would repent or relent of this coming destruction. And so he says, we're not eating. We're not drinking. We're going to be in sackcloth. I'm sitting in ashes. And it says here in verse 8, and this is something that we need to look at for today. He says, let men call on God earnestly, that each may turn from his wicked ways and from the violence which is in his hands. Have you done that? Have I done that? Has the church done that? Have we truly repented to God and turned from our wicked ways? Or are we still, still calling our own shots? Are we still saying we know more than God? We're going to decide what we want to do. Are we going to do it God's way? Are we going to do it our way? Well, God is judging us. And God is watching us. And while the world can unite around COVID-19, and it can unite around Black Lives Matter, and, and subduing police violence and so on, and all these other movements that we have, where are the voices of the church? Where is the unified voice of the church? We have a church that's in confusion. We have a church that can't even get unity among themselves. The world can come together on COVID-19 and suddenly worlds and, and, and countries and scientists are working together to get solutions, to find the vaccine. What is the church doing? What are we doing? We're too busy arguing over doctrinal things, denominational differences. We're not unified. We're not unified at all. Let me say this. I'm not mentioning any names because it would be pointless to mention names, but there are plenty of examples out there. Listen, there is a church, a well-known church recently that said, we are going to stay open no matter what our state says. Now, the state law currently right now is that churches are to be closed because of the onset of this. You could do things other way. You can still meet online. You can still have Zoom meetings, all kinds of things. You can do what we're doing. But this pastor got up and said, no, we are going to stay open. We're not going to pay attention to what the state's saying. We're not listening to the government. Well, the Bible tells us that we are to be in subjection to the leaders above us. I leave that where it's at. There's another church, many churches, that are practicing social distancing. And they're practicing good health habits. And they're making sure that people are wearing masks or they're doing social media. Whatever it is that they're doing, they're being responsible. But I also know of a church that for months now has been closed. No meetings, no YouTube, no Zoom, no prayer meetings, zip, nothing. Now here is a pastor who is not leading his flock. His flock has been left out there for months to just drift with no spiritual guidance, no spiritual food, because this church has decided not to do anything on social media. And so on the one hand, you have a church that's blatantly remaining open, even though people are getting sick. 
Then you have other churches in the middle that are trying to do what they think is right, depending on the laws in their particular state. And then we have another church or churches that are doing absolutely nothing. Where is the unified voice? Where are the leaders of the church standing up and saying, we need to obey God? The pastor that kept the church open, their opinion is, we obey God rather than man. Does the Bible say that? Yes. It says it in a certain context. The Bible also tells us we have to be in subjection and to pray for those who are in charge over us because God raises them up, whether you like them or not. Whether your political party is in office or not, God has raised them up. Where are today's sackcloth and ashes? Where are the people repenting on their knees in humility, begging God for forgiveness and seeking a godly solution to all of this? No. No. When the church starts looking and sounding and acting like the world, I posted it this morning. Something is very, very wrong. We have right here in this picture right here how it should be done let me show you the rest of this look what happens when true repentance and true humility comes through and god sees the sincerity of people look at this now the king of nineveh in verse 7 of course he issued the proclamation he said in verse 8 man and beast must be covered so maybe we will turn for our wicked ways and from the violence which is in his hands he continues in verse 9. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. Who knows? The king of Nineveh had no guarantee because they were heathens. They were not believers. Now we do see in verse 3 and verse 5 where it does say they believed in God. Not believed on God, believed in God. And now he's saying, who knows? Maybe as a result of our repentance, our humility, our making sure that we have taken all of our ego away, all of our self-importance away, all of what we think is a thriving nation and a thriving city and all of these wonderful things that we have, and the king is now the same even with all the people, even with the beasts. Everyone is on the same playing field. Everyone is in sackcloth. The king is in ashes. And he's saying, just maybe, just maybe, God will relent, he will withdraw, and he won't do what he said he's going to do. Maybe we may escape this. What are we doing about it today? See, th this is something, this is something that, uh, the more, the more I, I see, it just, it gets me angry. Doesn't it get you angry? Doesn't it upset you that we can be unified over a virus and we could be unified over Black Lives Matter and they are important, but we can't be unified when it comes to church, when it comes to the body of Christ. There's too much infighting. I want to be this denomination. I want to be that denomination. This church is going to open. This church is going to close. Where are the voices raising up and saying, am I the only one? Am I the only one calling for a modern day sackcloth and ashes? Am I the only one out here? Am I John the Baptist? Am I this lone voice out here crying into computer screens and on cell phones and wherever else God will let me preach? Am I the only one out here saying that we need to have a modern day revival? We need to have our own sackcloth and ashes. We need to go down in humility and repentance and seeking forgiveness from Almighty God. Where is it? Where is it happening? No, in the meantime, there may be some. And I'm not saying all of us in the body of Christ are guilty of this. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying here, I, I, I'm... <laughs> I'm saying right here that we have a perfect example of a nation, of a city that heard the word of God, heeded the word of God. And look what happens. Verse 10, look at this. This could happen for us. This could happen for our church today. This could happen where the viruses could be taken away, where there could be equity in the world, where we could start loving 
and treating each other and caring about one another the way Jesus taught us instead of playing games, whether political or religious. Look what happens. Verse 10, Jonah 3. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Read that again. God saw their deeds. He looked down in Nineveh. He saw from the king on down, he saw the humility. He saw the humility. He didn't see anyone acting on their own. He didn't see anyone being brazen. Everyone from the king to all the people to all the animals. He looked and he saw 100% humility and seeking repentance from the Lord, and seeking forgiveness from Almighty God. And when he looked down, what does the Bible says? When he saw their deeds, that they had turned from their wicked ways, then God relented. He backed off. He changed his mind of everything he said he was going to do, which was overthrowing them, and he did not do it. The Bible tells us that judgment begins in the house of God. Do you think there's judgment upon the house of God these days? Do you think here in 2020, when we are still arguing among ourselves in the church and we can't get together as a unified body of Christ, do you think God is bringing judgment on some of the churches? Do you think there's some arrogance out there among the pastors and the bishops and all of the leaders in the church? Do you think there's some people that are a little bit too full of themselves? Well, suddenly you can't merge with someone else. You can't come together. You've got to stay separate. And so this denomination is on this street corner. And this denomination is over on this street corner. And then down the street, you got another denomination. Well, when I see the protests in the street, I see black folks and I see white folks and I see Asian folks and I see young folks and old folks. And I see people gathering together. And when I see COVID-19... When I see COVID-19 and I see it's killing babies as well as old people and everyone in the middle, black and white and Asian and whatever. When I see that happening, there's a unification there. We're unified because we're looking for a solution. And so the medical world is looking for a solution. And in the government world and, and with Black Lives Matter, we're looking in the justice system for unification of justice. Well, we can all live equally. We all have equal rights. That all of us have equal opportunities. Nothing wrong with that. But we're not unified in the church. We're not. We're not unified in the church. Pastor A is preaching this. Pastor B is preaching that. Pastor C preaches this. Pastor D doesn't agree with any of them. So he preaches something else. Listen, there's one word of God. And you either accept this as truth or dismiss it. Don't play games with it. Don't pick and choose what you want to believe. Here's a, here is an example right in front of us of an ancient civilization that in their great city, they turned completely around. They believed God, and God did not do. He did not bring destruction upon them. Now, later on, he did. But at this point in time, God saw their deeds. He saw that they repented, and he relented. Church, church, we are long overdue. On repenting. We are long overdue of having sackcloth and ashes. And I propose this to you, to anyone who's listening. We, individually and collectively, as a body of Christ, need to go down in our own sackcloth and ashes. The sooner the better. Because God just may see our repentance. He may see our humility. He may see our forgiveness. He may see that we're serious. And maybe God will relent of the judgment that he's bringing upon us. Just maybe. If we do nothing, the church will continue to split and the church will continue to divide. God said that we were supposed to be lights of the world. We're supposed to let our light shine so that other people see us. The church light bulb is out. It blew out a while ago because we can't even get together among ourselves. Not long ago, I preached a message on unity. Can there be unity when there's so much diversity around? And I'll repost that for anyone who's interested, because it was a good message. It offended some people. Of course, this message is going to offend some people. Some of you I see were on here. You may have left already. I don't know. 
but I'm bringing to you what God has given me to give you. And for myself, it is long overdue. Sackcloth and ashes are long overdue. And we better start seeing today's sackcloth and ashes or the situation is going to get worse. More people are going to die. More people are going to be dead. More people are going to drift away from the church. And the church is no longer that shining spot on the hill. The church light is out. We have fallen in with the world. We look like the world. We act like the world. And we preach wishy-washy messages, feel-good stuff. We bring lots of people in to the big churches, lots of money coming in. And this is not preached. It's sackcloth and ashes time, my friends. It's sackcloth and ashes time. When are you going to do your part? When are we going to show God that we're serious? That we mean business? That we truly repent of our sins? Every day that goes by is a day closer to Jesus' return. Don't let it be tomorrow. Put on your sackcloth and your ashes today. Let God know that in your life, in your church, in your congregation, in your family, you repent. You see what's happening. And you need to repent. I need to repent. And if enough of us do it, God just may relent and not bring his judgment upon us us. I pray that this message has helped you. It may have angered you. You you may hate me right now. It's okay. God's word says in Isaiah 55 11, it says, my word does not return void. It's going to reach all those people he intended to reach. If this reached you today, if this affected you today, then this was meant for you today and you need to take this message and share it with everybody you can because we are living in the last days. We are living in times of peril and messages like this, however uncomfortable they are, need to go out and need to be preached. More messages like this need to be preached. The people need to be reached. People need to wake up. And so, if God convicts you to share this message, please do. And Bereans, we call ourselves, our little group online here, we call ourselves Bereans for Life. You know why? Because we made a pledge, we made a promise that we would search the scriptures daily, just like the Bereans did in Acts 17.11. We just don't hear the word. We search the scriptures every single day. Did you know about this part in Jonah chapter 3? Did you know about what the king did and had the proclamation all the way down to the animals? Did you know about that? Well, if you were studying and reading your Bible every day, you would have come across it. You would have eventually read it. You would have known exactly what this king did to prevent his city from being destroyed. Read your Bible. Study your Bible. Be a Berean. Acts 17.11 Lastly, we, here we are on the first Sunday of August. I want to thank all of you who prayed for us the last month in July. And I want to thank all of you who have been praying for me and for this ministry, for us, every single day. We appreciate your prayers. We feel them. We need them. As you can tell, we're in a battle. We're in a war. Satan doesn't like what this ministry stands for. He doesn't like what I say. He takes every opportunity to knock me down and to take this thing off the air. So I, 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 I just I, I keep praying for this ministry. That's all I can say in all humility. Just keep praying for this ministry. Thank you to those who stepped up in July and helped us financially. Um, those of you who know what's been happening in recent memory, you know that uh, there's no salary here now. Uh, this is the walk of faith. There are some things stirring behind the scenes. But right now, we need your support. I'm just telling you that. But that's between you and God. You don't have to give anything. As long as you subscribe to the YouTube channel, as long as you like this Facebook page, as long as you like it, us, us over on Twitter, whatever platform we show up on, make sure that you are alerted each time we're on the air because we're starting to do more broadcasts. Thank the Lord for that. But if God would lead you to support us financially, we sure could use it. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you we don't need it. We do. All ministries need money to live off of. But that's between you and God. You don't have to do it. But if God leads you to, there's three ways you can do it. Number one, if you're here on Facebook, you can do it right through Facebook Messenger. It's quick and easy, safe, secure. It takes less than a minute and it's done. If you're here, whether Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, we also have a PayPal information, which I will put up for you and you will have it in case you want to send something that way. And also, we have a couple of people to send good old-fashioned snail mail. It still works. Yes, the post office still delivers mail. So... If God would lead you to help us here in August as we start a new month, we would sure appreciate it. But if he doesn't, that's okay. I want you to keep coming back for every broadcast so that we can fellowship together. We can be together. 
We can learn from God's Word together. Thank you for those who are praying for us. Thank you for those who have stood with us financially. And let me just say this. If you're watching this live, it's Sunday. You know we have a Monday night manna program every Monday evening. I've been doing it for a couple of years now. Uh, tomorrow night, I want you to come back here at 7 p.m. Central Time, right on the platform you're watching me on right now, because I want to talk to you about a few things that are on my heart, a few things that have been happening, a few things that I believe you need to know. Uh, and it, tomorrow night, yes, we will have our time of man and we will have our time of reading from Scripture. And I will give you something that you can chew on and digest from the Word of God. But tomorrow, I also want to share my heart with you about a couple of things that are going on. And so I thank you for being here. I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you for being here for the Sunday message. Don't forget, share the message out and put on your sackcloth and ashes. Let's, let's show God we mean serious business. Thanks for being with me and God bless you.